Good morning. As she said, I'm Lamar Thomas. I'm a respiratory therapist, and I've probably been working here at the Christ Hospital for the better part of 27 plus years. Um, we're here today to discuss oxygen therapy and oxygen delivery device systems. First and foremost, I think we all need to just come up with a, a good baseline of, of knowledge. What is the amount of oxygen we're currently breathing? Anybody know? The air has several elements in it, nitrogen, oxygen, and we call it a fraction of inspired air. It's called FiO2. You'll hear that terminology quite a bit uh, throughout the rest of your career. Somebody will ask you, how much is the patient breathing in their oxygen? And we usually refer to that as, what is their FiO2? Currently, we are all breathing 21% oxygen. That's how much is in the air, 21%. So from a baseline, you know that at least everyone is breathing 21% oxygen. Typically, when we give supplemental oxygen, we do it via a device called a nasal cannula. And I believe that is what we have here. I'm gonna open this up for you all. This is simply called a nasal cannula. There are prongs that fit inside the patient's nose, like so, with the ends indented inward toward the nares. That is the appropriate way to apply this device. They hook around the ears. Sometimes they hook around the back of the head. And with this nasal cannula, we can safely, in terms of practice, we can safely deliver up to six liters per minute via this device here called the nasal cannula. But that is typically the first device of choice when looking at delivery of supplemental oxygen. A part of our practice here at the Christ Hospital is we tend to humidify or add moisture to the flow of gas that comes via this device if it is at least three liters or higher. It is one of the things that we like to do. The gas has a tendency to dry out the mucosal membrane inside the nares, thus making it very irritable and sometimes causing a little of uh, personal insult to the patient's airways, especially around the turbinates. So that's why we feel that we moisturize the gas being delivered. It makes the patient feel more comfortable, more tolerable from the supplemental device and the gas that's being supplied. So we do that. I'm looking, I don't see any of the little bottles that we usually give, but there's usually little bottles that will be adjacent to the flow meter that's connected to the wall. And I don't know, how many of you are familiar with the hospital settings in terms of gas outlets and what you see in and out of a typical patient's room? Typically, you'll have devices in the, in the walls that are either air, gas, and possibly suction. We usually put in something called flow meters, air flow meters or oxygen flow meters that engage the gas source that is being piped into the rooms. And then there's a knob that helps to determine what exact liter flow you have. The tip of that is connected into the O2 flow meter, and we are able to then deliver to the patient. Yes, sir. Why is the oxygen um, given in units of liters when it's a gas? When it's a gas? Yeah. Well, technically, when we first get oxygen, it's a liquid. What happens is there's a big silo outside of our building and liquid oxygen is delivered twice a week to this hospital. The liquid oxygen in that state, we are able to have a large amount of bulk oxygen. As it is dispensed through the plumbing, through the pipes, through the systems, a condensation effect takes place and then the gas expands. So as it becomes a little bit warmer and cools off, all of a sudden the liquid turns to gas, it becomes a large uh, amount of, of oxygen that we can then dust dispense throughout this entire building. So that's the premise. It starts off as a liquid. And so we measure it from that sense. And then of course, once it gets to the patient, it is a gas.
But the way we have it delivered and the way we utilize it, we measure it in liters per minute. Okay? Yep. All right. So it actually starts off as a liquid. Because of the capacity of condensation, we are able to get so much more in that tank in our space. Oh, Sherry's cute. Now, as I said before, when we decide that we're at three liters or higher for patient comfort, we'll add this little device. This is called humidification. It'll attach to the flow meter and that tubing, open port, instead of going straight to the flow meter, now connects here. And what happens, the current of gas flows through here and picks up droplets, little bits, droplets of moisture that carries over to the patient to allow for the patient to get a little bit of moisture at the turbinate and the mucosal areas. All right, so we've established that normal healthy folks typically only need 21% of oxygen. That's what we do, we walk around, we have no problems. Someone who is sick, someone who has uh, been compromised, whether or not they have a direct impact on their lungs, or a secondary impact to the lungs. All of a sudden, their oxygen, carbon dioxide, gas exchange is hampered or um, slowed. And for that reason, we decide to deliver supplemental oxygen. Um, if we determine that six liters is not enough, historically, this device was used as a home care conservation tool within the hospitals, and you'll find this in most hospitals, this device called an oximizer will deliver upwards of 15 liters per minute to the patient. So if they needed a larger concentration of oxygen, if you work in various hospitals, you'll see this device being utilized. So this oximizer, which was originally designed for the home care patient, because not only could it deliver a high level, it could give you very small amounts in a very safe manner if a patient only needed a quarter or of a liter, an eighth of a liter of oxygen. This little mustache serves as a reservoir so that the gas would sit there until the patient actually needed it and so that the flow could actually be stored here sufficiently and then when the patient took a breath in, they get the amount they need. Same premise on the high level. This same mustache serves as a reservoir, and it's like a 30 ml bolus that the patient could have of just pure oxygen. And they would have this sit there at a prescribed liter flow so that the patient would then have the amount of oxygen needed to exist. There you go. Now, in our institution, we're moving away from that device, and we're looking to use this device a little bit more. This device is called the OxyMass. This OxyMass can deliver anywhere from one to possibly 15 liters per minute. And this is what you'll probably be seeing become the new standard here at the Christ Hospital. The OxyMask is a very efficient device and it allows, again, for the great range of therapy in terms of liter flows. And I'm gonna pass this around. Has a small little turbinate in here that spins and that creates a little vacuum so that there instead of having your your bolus in the mustache you have a vortex here that allows for in, increased FiO2. So that's more of the device that you'll be seeing in the future as the oximizer becomes a thing of the past here at this institution. We have several different masks. One of the things that the OxyMask does versus the Oximizer, it can give you a higher amount of FiO2, which means a higher concentration of oxygen delivery at the higher levels. It also has open ports that allows for the actual skin to actually breathe versus the conventional mask. One of the things that we cannot do with the Oximizer we cannot actually humidify or put moisture to that device because of the large bore tubings. It would pick up larger droplets of water that would probably be an irritant to the patient and then to some degree have a drowning sensation to the patient with all that water. So the Oximizer, while it is a very open device, has a lot of drawbacks in terms of its application to the patient. And it's a much, the OxyMask is a much more efficient tool, especially in the presence of hypoxia and hypoxemia. We all get that? What is hypoxia? Say again? The absence of oxygen. It's a state that we can go through for At what level? Um, From a biological standpoint, hypoxia exists at what level? 
altitude. <laughs> cellular. Cellular. Hypoxia is that cellular. Where is hypoxemia? At what point are we saying someone is hypoxemic? That's in the blood. So typically when we refer to someone being hypoxemic, then they have a low oxygen in the blood levels. If it's hypoxia, as this young lady was uh, mentioning, it is on the cellular level, at which point the cells are starving. A lot of times um, we, th we tend to think of oxygen as gas for your heart or gas for your, your, your body. The cells need oxygens to thrive. The heart needs oxygen to continue. It's like your car needing gas to run. One don't work without the other. So that's one way of thinking about the true vital use of oxygen. And what you'll come to discover is that you have various patients who have various illnesses that will either predicate the, 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 the diagnosis of hypoxemia or actually true hypoxia. Which is worse? What do you think is worse? The cells. Cells die, everything dies. This device, I call it the respiratory therapist's worst enemy. There's not one respiratory therapist that'll like this device, and then we'll explain why. But this is called the simple mask. Its range is typically from 4 to 12 liters per minute of applicable use. 4 to 12 liters is what people typically use the simple mask for. Some people say in terms of a safety, they like to think of it from a six to 12 range. They tend to not want to go under six liters, and I'll explain why. If you've seen the oxy mask and you saw the open ports, and you'll look at this mask and you'll see less of an open area within the mask itself, there's a certain science to this that um, will give prudence to why respiratory therapists sometimes do not like the application of this device. We usually get a call from PACU or some area where they're weaning a post-op patient and they're utilizing the simple mask and everything seems to be going good. They started off at about 10 liters, their saturations were good, everything seemed fine, numbers were fine, patient was um, alert and oriented and talking to them. And so the doctor says, well, wean their oxygen so we can get them transferred out. So you begin to wean their oxygen down and you got them down to four and then you get them down to three, then you're down to just two liters per minute. And that's typically when I get the call, because now I get the call and they say, we're not sure what's going on with our patient. They're, they're drowsy, they're, they're hard to awaken, some may be somnolent, um, their respirators are, are impacted, they're not breathing as much as they could or as much as they used to, and they're questioning what's going on with the patient. Anybody have an answer? Yes, sir. They're using that mask. You're, you're kind of there. They're using a simple mask. They're down to about two liters. And remember what did I say the, the, the range of flow was? Four to 12. Four to 12. People like to think six to 12 for safety. What happens with the simple mask? Because of the entrainment of it, you have to have enough flow to eliminate carbon dioxide away from the patient. So what's happening at that two liter level with that mask on, the patient's rebreathing carbon dioxide. So if their CO2 level goes up, their level of consciousness fades. And you could have a bigger respiratory uh, incident than what you were prepared for if you allow that to continue. So typically the first thing I like to do is get the mask off of them. Give them a regular cannula. Just try to do whatever I can to allow them the opportunity to breathe before we have to do anything more invasive to them. So that's what's going on. Anything less than four liters per minute on a simple mask is a bad thing because they will rebreathe their CO2 that they exhale, and that's a bad thing. Do we know the normal range for carbon dioxide in the body? Normal range for carbon dioxide is 35 to 45. If you blow too much carbon dioxide out of your system, your pH will rise and you can become alkalotic. 
if you do not blow enough CO2 out your system and that number grows, the pH drops and you would be deemed to be acidotic. Your pH range is 7.3. 3.5 to 7.45. Very important number as you start uh, learning about arterial blood gas analysis. Carbon dioxide's normal range is 35 to 45. And that's measured in torrs. If you blow off too much CO2, in other words, that number is below 35, you could be termed alkalotic if your pH is above 7.45. If the pH level go up. Yes, low CO2, high pH. High CO2, low pH. So if your carbon dioxide level is around 60 and your pH is 7.30, that would be deemed a respiratory acidosis. That's a bad thing. That goes back to the patient who had the mask on and couldn't exhale all, all their carbon dioxide. It built up in them and they became very drowsy. And typically your pH is going to drop. So these are telling signs of instability. And we want to make sure that, especially during the monitoring process, we, we have an understanding of our norm numbers and we have an understanding of what we need to do from an oxygen delivery standpoint to assure their safety. This is not typically what I would consider a O2 delivery device, but it is. We have monitors that we call entitled CO2 monitors that have the capacity of measuring their carbon dioxide while giving supplemental oxygen to the patient. So there's actually the ability to have a patient wear this. It's kind of fancy looking. As they breathe out, we find their, their carbon dioxide level because of the prongs feeding back to a machine that gives a digital reading. And then down here in this little port, you're actually gonna get some oxygen. So you have the ability to give oxygen and measure their carbon dioxide level. This is typically a device that's used on a lot of our med surge floors, as well as our post anesthesia surgical unit. So it's a cute device. It's not the typical standard O2 delivery system device. However, it does do both. We typically think of it in terms of the measurement of their carbon dioxide. Entitled CO2 device. What do we call it? It's actually a transducer. <laughs> All right. So we know that. 21% baseline, everybody's nice and fine and healthy, no problems. Patient's sick, they need some supplemental oxygen. You grab the nasal cannula, you can go all the way up as high as six liters. With the simple mass, you can go as high as 12. With the oxy mass, you know you can go as high as 15. With the oximizer, you know you can go as high as 15. So all these different devices gives you all these different ranges. Is there an exact FiO2 with some of these devices? Well, that is patient dependent on most of them. With the nasal cannula, it's very erratic based on the patient's respiratory rate and their level of hypoxia as to what exactly their FiO2 they're getting. We can approximate, we can give ballpark, but we can't give exacts. With a nasal cannula, if a patient's on five liters per minute, we equate that as to 40% FiO2. Again, it's not exact science because you have the opening of the patient's mouth, you have the opening of the device, it's not a closed system, and you have the ability to have ambient air come in that would dilute the amount of oxygen going in. So that's why it's a hard measurement. Same thing with the oximizer. We think we're delivering 70, 80%. But we're ballparking. We don't have an exact measurement. We don't know for sure exactly because patient's respiratory rate, how much air they breathe in fast will help, again, dilute the amount of oxygen being delivered. The oxy mass, because of its condition, because of the way it's designed, gives you a better FiO2 in terms of assured FiO2 of what you're delivering, but it also is not exact. There's only a few devices that you can say we have an exact range.
Ah, and here's one of them. This is called a Venturi mask. The Venturi mask was designed for ex just that purpose, to deliver an exact FiO2, to assure the physician that what they've ordered is what the patient is going to get. Now, we'll talk about the rationale for that as well, but I wanna make sure that you have an opportunity to look at this, see that it gives you an FiO2 and the amount of oxygen that should be bled in. It has a Venturi effect, and of course, it was named after someone who was very smarter than me, who was able to come up with this concept, and these little portals were able to manage the amount of oxygen that is entrained with air so that it can control the amount of FiO2 being delivered. And I'm gonna start it over here. This is the Venturi mask, or Venti mask. It, of course, gives the exact FiO2 and that's really, really, really good for a particular patient populace. If we think about um, COPD ears, we all know what COPD means. We're all familiar with that term, COPD? Okay. Within that COPD family exists another patient populace. You know, COPD ears, we have the emphysema, uh, bronchiectasis, bronchitis. Uh, sometimes people associate asthma as being sometimes uh, a part of that COPD family. But there's a specific patient populace where the Venturi mask is most useful. Any ideas? CO2 retainers. We have a group of patients who we call CO2 retainers where chronically their carbon dioxide level is always high based on how they've lived throughout their life, based on their disease state, and based on um, lung complicity in terms of gas exchange. These people have adjusted, their body has adopted to a higher level of carbon dioxide staying within their system. And so their mechanism for breathing is a little bit different than ours they are able to exist with CO2s higher than 45. It's not uncommon to have a CO2 retainer with a CO2 of 75, and yet their pH be normal. Now, why is, why is that? Why is that? How can that be? Did I not just say that if one goes up, the other goes up? You think I'm selling you some goods here? <laughs> selling you a used car? Well, as you are, um, Studying arterial blood gases, you know there's other things that are being analyzed, something called base SS and bicarbonate levels, HCO3. So bicarbonate levels, consequently, also fluctuate back and forth. Tip, depending upon which, which lab values you're looking at, your normal range can be anywhere between 22 to 26, or sometimes 22 to 28, depending upon what the lab values are. I think here we go 22 to 26 as the normal range for bicarbonate levels. Now, a CO2 retainer, because they live at that level and they've maintained this state for so long, their bicarbonate level goes up. As the bar carbonate level goes up, so does the pH. Those correspond directly. If the, carb, if the bicarb level goes up, your pH goes up. So now you've got a balancing act. Yeah, the CO2 goes up, pH drops. But the bicarbonate all goes up and this, your pH rises back. And so these people balance themselves biologically by having a high bicarbonate level to offset the high carbon dioxide level. And those are your CO2 retainers. Now, why is all that important when we're talking about oxygen delivery and that doggone Venturi mask? Well, as I said before, those people don't breathe like we do. Their triggering mechanism is a little different. If I give them too much oxygen, they tend to think that Oh, I don't have to breathe anymore. And they will shut down. Their respiratory drive will cease. That's why it's important not to give a carbon dioxide retainer too much oxygen. Because their body will think it no longer needs to breathe. So the doctor wants to give them just enough. Not too much. 
Make sense? You've heard some of this stuff before, I'm sure. CO2 retainers, and a lot of times we, we confuse our COPDers with the CO2 family because not every COPDer retains carbon dioxide. You may have a variety, a range of different ABG results for your COPDers, but that CO2 retainer is a specific class unto itself. Okay. Back in my day, the popular show was ER. What's a popular medical show these days? Scrubs was pretty cool. Scrubs was cool. I remember that, Zach guy. What is it? Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. That's still on? Okay, cool. Okay. So you're watching Grey's Anatomy. They're rolling somebody through the ER, and they've got the patient, you know, on the gurney, and they're talking to him, and they got this mask on, and they're telling him, are you going to be okay, Mr. Smith? You're going to be fine. Mr. Smith says, yeah, okay, fine. My wife and I, my wife's a nurse, my wife and I will sit there watching TV and going, that is so bogus. You're sitting up there suffocating the patient and they're talking back to you. This is one of those things when you're in the medical field, you take these little shows apart because you go, that couldn't happen in real life. Oh, that is so fake. You only know that because you're in the field. <laughs> Typical people watching TV think it's cool. But what you typically see a lot of times in these shows is this little mask and this little bag and they're on there and they're talking, they're breathing fine, they're just going just as fine as can be. The reality of it is this is a non-rebreather mask. It's called a 100% non-rebreather mask, although I have to say I don't think it really ever, ever truly gets up to 100%. That being said, there's two flaps on this thing. The flaps do not allow you to entrain room air. So if they shove this mask on you and all you have for a gas supply is this, what are you breathing? You're not even breathing that, you're suffocating. Think about it, you can't suck in, here's your source and it's flat. So that's why my wife and I laugh every time we watch these shows. We're going, that is so bogus. All right, this non-rebreather mask has a reservoir. This reservoir must be filled with oxygen in order for the patient to have a gas source. You plug it in, it inflates, you see it breathe with the patient. Now, a lot of people say, how much do you feel? What's the liter flow? What's the exact amount? And the rule of thumb is, you want to see the bag inflated, and you want to see it breathe with the patient. If it collapses every time the patient takes a breath in, there's not enough flow. If when the patient's breathing, it stays full and inflated, then it may be too much flow and it's overwhelming the patient. You know, it's like the dog with the head out the window kind of ex experience, or when you stick your head out of the window going down I-75 at 80 miles an hour. You know, that's that experience. So you can have too much flow and you can have too little, but you see, you see the bag inflated where the bag breathes with the patient but doesn't collapse. That's the appropriate amount. You want a ballpark figure anyway? anywhere from 10 to 12, sometimes 15 liters, depending upon the situation. It all depends on the patient, it's very patient dependent. But this is your standard, if all else fails, grab the non-rebreather, Katie bar the door, you're about to have some bad things about to happen kind of device. If you're on this, trust me, you've got a critically ill patient. They call it 100% because, well, that's about the much you can go is 100%. We start at 21, baseline. Now you're back all the way up to quote unquote 100%, which again, if we were to actually do a measurement at that point, you might be at 89, 90% FiO2. Again, it depends on what's going on with the patient. But this is your standard non-rebreather. Now one of the things that you'll notice, especially as you're practicing in the hospital, there'll be a flap missing on the side. There's a reason for the flap missing on the side when you actually start taking care of these patients. Any idea why there's a flap missing on one side or there will be when you see this actually on a patient? CO2 to escape? Close. More for, and the CO2 will escape because of the one-way flaps. The flaps breathe out, but they can't breathe in. That's why they're one way. But you're really close. It's just, just, flip, it's just flip your thinking. So they can breathe in? Bingo. So they can breathe in in case we have 
caregiver error. Like that scene in Grey's Anatomy. Okay, if we do not have the bag inflated, and now all of a sudden we don't have the ability for them to take in a breath because we've sealed it all off and that bag is flat, there's that little port of ambient air they can, they can breathe despite us. So despite all of our good intentions, we do make mistakes. If that mistake is made, that's why there's only one flap on one side of the mask. So they can breathe at least nothing else, 21% versus nothing. You don't see a lot of partial non-rebreathers much anymore, but one of the things that a partial non-rebreather does is allow for that gas exchange and entrainment. Would I call that a partial non-rebreather? No, because of the little port and the bottom of the mask, there's a little port there that allows for the exchange of gas to come through there. With the partial non-rebreather, that little port is completely absent. So that's the difference between the two. Of a non-rebreather and a partial non-rebreather, there's a little port at the bottom of the mask right before the reservoir that's totally different from that one. This one has a flap seal, the partial non-rebreather does not. But I guess in a sense, would you take that flap off the side, you've kind of created that little sensation anyway. That being said, this is considered as a standard non-rebreather mask. Make sense? You take a lot of notes. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. At least I haven't put you to sleep. All right, so now we've gone from 21%, everything's fine, we're all doing just fine, to your patient needing some supplemental oxygen with the nasal cannula, to your patient having some hypoxemic episodes and you either have used an oximizer or an oxy mask or some type of device, or you've had a patient who is a CO2 retainer and the physician has prescribed an exact FiO2 for you to deliver your oxygen and you use the Venturi mask. And now you've got your patient who is hypoxic and who's having some respiratory distress and who has some real serious oxygenation issues and now you've gotten the non-rebreather mask out. Now what if all that fails? Just clock out and go home? What do you do at that point when the 100% non-rebreather mask is no longer sufficient or adequate for your patient's O2 demands? Yeah, two answers, two right answers, depending upon what the patient condition is. You can either go straight to intubation or you can give positive pressure ventilation through a mask, typically referred to as CPAP. You all heard of CPAP before? Okay, what's it mean? Well, you put the two together, you both have the right answer. <laughs> Continuous positive airway pressure. So what does that mean? That at some prescribed level of pressure, we are continuously blowing pressure to the patient to A, stent the airway open, B, allow for gas exchange through the upper airways and hopefully down distally into bronchial tracheal tree, and allow for better oxygenation and better ventilation. That's CPAP, one pressure. Then there's something called BiPAP, where we have two pressures. Now all of a sudden, you're going to have CPAP, which is usually a pressure to keep airway open and is on the exhalation level. You add the other inspiratory pressure, which will make it BiPAP, and now you have a pressure that will help augment their inspiratory phase. So you can have two levels of pressure. So you can have CPAP, you can have BiPAP. Both are very useful, both have their place, but you also could, as the lady suggested, intubate. Now what does that mean to intubate? Say again? Yes, well you put a tube, yes, down their throat, actually through the vocal cords, about two centimeters above the carina. You secure it with some type of secure device holder. And then you would attach that either to a bag mask ventilating, AMBU, or you could attach it to an actual machine, which is called a ventilator, which would help breathe them, breathe for them. So that is probably the end game for someone who is crucially sick and hypoxic, is that we would be forced to intubate them. When would you not intubate them? And they're sick, and they're not doing well, and they're having 
oxygenation issue. No, uh, we, could, we could work around a stoma. I can always put something around that hole to oxygenate and ventilate. Even though it would, be, it would not be considered intubation, it would still be a way of delivering positive pressure. But when would you not intubate someone in that scenario? Well, that's a concern. However, we would manage that as well. That's why we have suction equipment and we have the ability to always put something together that will take care of gastric distent and gastric content and still be able to manage the airway. But when would you not intubate someone? If they're breathing on their own to well, that's, that's a plus. Degree. I mean, it, I'm a psych nurse, a lot of the medical staff. You're fine. Yes, in the back. Well, sometimes we'll intubate them to protect their airway when they're having a seizure. Because one of the first things you want to think about if they're having a seizure, they can bite their tongue, they can occlude their own airway. We can have a lot of problems. So sometimes the first things we do is think about intubation to protect their airway during a seizure. But when somebody's having respiratory insufficiency, respiratory difficulties, oxygenation issues, and you've maxed out on all of these fancy things we've done, non breather, CPAP, BiPAP, and the only thing left is intubation, why wouldn't you? Maybe if they have like a, a medical, um, whatever, says that they don't want to be intubated? Bingo, they don't want to, they don't want it. They have a living will. Medical power of attorney. They have specific written instructions that says, I do not want to be intubated. Can't go against their wishes. Now, in lieu of that, if there is no such understanding, if there is no such papers written out, filled out, electronically done in EPIC, if we do not know, it is for us to resuscitate, to do these types of things. We are licensed to do these things. A question. Yes. A moment ago when you were talking about CO2 concentration, you used the word TOR. What, what is that? Okay. That's just another word for measurement of millimeters of, of mercury. When, when, we, when we talk about measurements, you could say millimeters of mercury or TORS, as the lady who talks aviation back there knows, it is the level of measurement of ambient air because as you go higher in the air, the pressure changes. And that pressure is equivalent to millimeters of mercury or TOR. T-O-R-R. -R. And sometimes I just say that thinking, you know, I must know what I'm talking about. Um, so, we've gone from 21%, everything's fine with the world, to a very sick patient, to if you have the consent, you have to intubate a very sick person. And then the process of weaning begins, because you, now you have to take them from there all the way back. And that's a process that you'll learn more about as you continue your education. Um, other devices for oxygenation. We have something called high flow or OptiFlow, where there's a big machine, sits on a blender, and believe it or not, I can deliver with this machine up to 70 liters per minute with a controlled FiO2. We've only had these machines for a couple of years. It's kind of new technology that's been out for like the last decade or so. They've tweaked it, they've improved it. And one of the luxuries of it is we're able to humidify and warm the gas that we deliver with that machine. So that takes away a lot of the harshness of, of the, the, the flow that comes to the patient that causes a lot of irritability because now we've able to, to moisturize and warm it up and the patient's able to receive it in a much more comfortable manner. So that's something new that we're doing in certain areas, mostly the critical care areas. But again, it's another O2 delivery system that we're able to use for our patients to hopefully ward off the possible intubation. And that's all we're doing. We're trying to give enough support to the patient that they stabilize themselves, maintain normalcy, so that they don't get sicker, that we have to do more invasive things to them. Now I know I've rattled my, 
my, my mind here and I've said a lot of things. And hopefully if you have any questions at all, you'll feel comfortable telling me or asking me. Um, but for, by and large, I think that will probably conclude the lecture for today. I'm open to questions.